Hi everyone and thanks again for joining. In the last episode we covered Romans chapter 2 where Paul focused on what true repentance is and God's impartial judgment which will come upon those who do not trust Christ for their salvation. Now let's dive into Romans 3 and continue exploring Paul's message. We'll start with verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew or what profit is there in circumcision? Well, this follows on from chapter 2, where Paul was addressing Israel directly in the second half of the last chapter. And Paul now raises the question that might arise from his previous arguments. What benefit, if any, is there in being a Jew or being circumcised? So after emphasizing that outward signs like circumcision or law keeping do not make anyone righteous, Paul is about to address the advantages that the Jews had in a historical sense. Let's look at verse 2. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So Paul affirms that the Jews have significant advantages primarily because they were entrusted with the oracles of God, God's word and his revelations, the Torah, the covenants, the law. They were all given to Israel. This was a great privilege as they were the recipients of God's law of God's promises and covenants, which provided them with a deep understanding of God's will. So the descendants of Jacob, Israel, were specifically chosen by God during that dispensation. Let's have a look at verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So Paul's asking whether the unbelief of some Jews nullifies God's faithfulness here. He's emphasizing that even if some did not believe or were unfaithful, it does not undermine or change the truth of God's promises or his faithfulness to his covenant with those particular people that he made. His promises were to Israel, and whether his promises would be kept or not were not necessarily dependent on their obedience or their belief. Verse 4, God forbid, yea, Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might be justified in thy sayings and might overcome when thou art judged. So here Paul strongly refutes the idea that God's faithfulness could be nullified by human unbelief. He declares that God is always true, regardless of what we might think is right or wrong. Let every man be a liar, he says. This underscores the idea that God's truth and righteousness stands firm regardless of human failure. Paul's quoting from Psalm 51.4 here to show that God's judgment is always just. Verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man. So Paul here introduces a hypothetical objection. If human unrighteousness serves to highlight God's righteousness, then is it unjust for God to punish sin? Paul is obviously anticipating the argument that some might make to justify their sin by claiming it shows God's goodness more clearly. Verse 6, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? So immediately Paul rejects this possible faulty reasoning. If God did not judge unrighteousness he could not be the righteous judge of the world paul affirms that god's justice is necessary and cannot be compromised by human attempts to twist his righteousness for their own benefit verse 7 for if the truth of god has more abounded through my lie unto his glory why yet am i also judged as a sinner so he continues with another hypothetical objection here saying that If God's truth is magnified through human sin, why should the sinner be judged? He is again pointing out the flawed logic of justifying sin by claiming that it somehow glorifies God. Paul dismisses this as a misunderstanding of God's justice. Verse 8, And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. See, at the time when Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God, 
He was attacked the very same way that we are today, who preach the gospel of Christ, who preach the word rightly divided. The attacks mostly come from within Christian or religious circles rather than from outside. These days you'll hear people say, hey, this guy's preaching grace. He says he can do whatever he wants. You can sin all you want with this greasy grace. He says we can just sin and we're fine. This comes from a total lack of understanding of the gospel. To understand Paul's letters, it requires study, deep study. Even Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, he explains himself. After confirming the wisdom and revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul, that the things Paul teaches are difficult to understand. And they are. They're contrary to our human nature and human logic in a lot of cases. Paul teaches the opposite of what we might think is normal. It's the opposite of religion. This is the beauty of the revelation that was specifically given to Paul because in Paul's writings is truth. And here in verse 8, Paul addresses those with carnal minds who falsely accuse him of teaching that people should do evil so that good may result, meaning that sin could somehow increase the grace of God. He condemns this slander and affirms that those who twist his teaching in this way are rightly condemned. Even Peter says in Second Peter that if you do mess around with Paul's teachings, it will result in damnation. Paul's message is about grace, but it never encourages, nor does it justify sin. Instead, it highlights it to the extent that it is impossible to deny that we all pretty much sin every minute of every single day. In these first eight verses, Paul anticipates and addresses possible objections that might arise from his teachings, emphasizing that God's righteousness and justice are unshakable, even in the face of human sin and unbelief. He makes it clear that God's judgment is always just, and human attempts to excuse or justify sin by pointing to God's righteousness will not stand. Paul strongly refutes any idea that sin can somehow glorify God, or that God would be unjust in his judgment of sin. As we get to verse 9, Paul starts to get pretty serious. If you're easily offended, strap yourself in. Verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So Paul is concluding clearly that there's no group, doesn't matter what you are, whether you're Jew, Gentile or what, no one has an advantage when it comes to sin. Everyone is under sin, subject to God's judgment. Paul's already demonstrated this earlier in Romans, showing that all humanity, regardless of background, is guilty before God. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's a quote from Psalm 14. Paul begins quoting from the Old Testament to emphasize that no one is righteous on their own. There is none righteous, no, not one, is quote from Psalm 14 verses 1 to 3 and Psalm 53 verses 1 to 3. This is a universal statement that reinforces the idea that all people are sinful and no one can, can claim righteousness apart from God. Verse 11, there is none that understands, there is none that seeks after God. This is a sobering truth that no one truly seeks after God by their own power. This highlights the fallen nature of humanity, our inability to reach out to God without his intervention. People left to their own devices do not naturally pursue God or understand his ways. Now, I don't want to go too far off the track here, but this raises an issue with Calvinism. Calvinists will use this verse to support the doctrine of what they call total depravity, suggesting that because of human sinfulness, no one is capable of seeking God unless God first regenerates them, picks some, rejects the others. This interpretation can be corrected by emphasizing that Paul is describing the universal sinful condition of humanity, how all people left to their own devices fall short of God's standards. This verse reflects the reality that sin has corrupted human understanding and desires, but it doesn't mean that people cannot respond to God's call. The verse is not saying that people are completely incapable of responding to God, but rather it underscores humanity's natural tendency to go astray. Verse 
While humanity, while humanity doesn't naturally seek God on their own due to sin, God still reaches out to all people through his grace, offering the invitation to salvation. John 12, 32, Titus 2, 11, via his word and the message of salvation in Christ. So what it, what's going on here is the emphasis is on our universal need for God, not on a predestined inability to respond. Though sin affects our ability to fully seek God, the Bible affirms that people can respond to God's call. Acts 17, 27 and Revelation 22, 17. God's grace makes it possible for anyone to come to faith when they recognize their need for a savior. Now, I don't want to get into the all of the errors of Calvinism here, but as we move through the Bible, things like this are going to pop up. And this verse is one that they use to support their false ideology. So I'm going to bring it up as they come across. Romans 3 verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not even one. Paul again stresses the universality of sin. Unprofitable. All have strayed from God's path and no one does good in true righteous sense. This, state, this statement itself doesn't mean people can't do good things, but rather that no one meets the perfect standard of God's righteousness. Our intentions are contrary to God much of the time. We're driven by selfish motivations, greed, wealth, luxury, Sometimes even the opposite. It might be poverty to try to make yourself feel like you're suffering for Christ. The motivation is what's important and that is what is often skewed. It's self-righteous and these motivations in themselves are selfish. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Under their lips. Okay. This vivid description of sinful speech comes from Psalm 5, 9 and Psalm 140, verse 3. Paul is highlighting how sin infects even the way we speak. Deceit, lies, manipulation, harmful speech are all evidence of humanity's sinful condition. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Paul keeps going here. Quoting from Psalm 10, 7, so he's using a lot of quotes from Psalms from the Old Testament. Paul points to how the sinful heart is reflected in the words people use. The mouth, filled with cursing and bitterness, shows the deep corruption that lies within. I find it funny how Christian people will say sugar instead of... Oh, they'll say that's not cursing, That's I, I just said sugar. But without realizing that in, in seriousness it's the same thing. In the eyes of man, the latter is less socially acceptable, but the manner in which it's said is what the verse is pointing at. Some might say this is an overreach, but this is God's standard. His standard is unattainable. That's the message here. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Taken from Isaiah 59, 7, Paul's pointing out that sin manifests itself in violence and harm towards others. Humanity apart from God quickly resorts to destructive behavior, demonstrating the depravity that permeates the world. This doesn't necessarily mean just physical violence, but anything that would harm another person in any way and to any degree. For example, you could be leaving someone out of a group or a conversation. You could be getting angry at another driver on the road. Something as harmless as that would fall into this category. Verse 16, destruction and misery are in their ways. This further describes the consequences of sin. Wherever sinful humanity goes, destruction and misery will follow. It'll be problems in relationships, problems in families, strife. It all comes from sin. This highlights the tragic results of living apart from God's will and outside of Christ. Verse 17, and the way of peace have they not known? So sinful humanity does not know true peace. They might have times of peace, but they don't know what true peace is. Without reconciliation to God, there is no lasting peace, either within oneself or between people. Paul is stressing that sin has disrupted the peace that was intended between God and humanity. Selfishness, bitterness, arrogance, greed, none of this brings peace. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. 
quoting from Psalm 36 and verse 1, Paul states the root problem, a lack of reverence or fear of God. Without the fear of God, people are unrestrained in their sin, living as if there's no accountability to a holy and righteous creator. Justifying themselves, they deny God. They reject Christ and secure their seat at the judgment. Right? So when a person justifies themselves and makes an excuse for what they're doing, oh no, I'm not really doing that. No, no, that's not what it is. You are rejecting Christ and securing your seat in front of the judgment. So now Paul's discussed the depravity of humanity, quoting extensively from the Old Testament to show that no one is righteous. None. The universal sinfulness of both Jews and Gentiles leaves all people in need of salvation. He paints a very vivid picture of how deeply sin has affected every aspect of human nature, from our speech to our actions to our relationships. Paul's argument makes it clear that everyone stands guilty before God, setting the stage for the profound need for grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. Verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So here Paul explains that the law speaks to those who are under it, which is Israel, Old Testament Israel. But its purpose, the purpose of the law extends to the whole world. The law itself is designed to expose sin. It's designed to render everyone guilty before God. The law is designed to shine the light on sin. No one can claim righteousness based on their works or their ability to keep the law. This verse highlights that the law was given not for us to try to follow, but to show the universal need for salvation, silencing any argument that we can earn our way to God. If you're keeping the Sabbath, if you're doing anything that is written in that law because you think that that's what you need to do for your salvation, or that it's bringing you some kind of favor in the eyes of God, watch out. Romans 3.20 Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Again, no one can be justified, which means to be declared righteous, by keeping the law. The law was not given as a means of earning salvation, but it was there to reveal our sin and our desperate need for grace. This is what separates the truth of Christ from any man-made religion on earth. Every religion on earth requires effort, works, in order to get a chance of salvation at the very best. True Christianity does not. It's through the law that we become aware of sin, but the law itself does not provide the power for anyone to be saved. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So here Paul introduces some very good news. God's righteousness is now available apart from the law. But now, it's a very important verse here. Okay, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So this righteousness was spoken of by the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. And it all points to Jesus Christ. Righteousness is now revealed through Christ through his finished work, not by any human effort or human law keeping. You've got to remember Christ kept the law and he kept it perfectly. We can't do that. He's the only one that ever did that and he's the only one that ever will do that. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. God's righteousness comes by faith of Jesus Christ and is available to everyone who believes, whether Jew or Gentile. So by faith of who? By faith of Jesus Christ. His faith justifies us. There's no distinction between people when it comes to receiving God's righteousness through faith. Salvation is not based on works. It's not based on background, status, ability, but purely on faith. Our faith is in Christ's perfect faith, which then justifies us 
When we get to verse 30, I'm going to expand on faith of Christ a little bit more. Just keep this one in your mind. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, this verse sums up Paul's argument that all people, regardless of their background, have sinned and fall short of God's standard of righteousness. This has been the theme, for constant theme for the last three chapters. No one measures up on their own. We all need Christ's saving work. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So being justified, which is to be declared righteous, is a free gift given by God's grace through the redemption provided by Jesus Christ. We are saved by his sacrifice, not by our works, not by our efforts. And this salvation is freely available to all who believe. It is a gift up to you whether you want to accept it, reject it, you do what you like with it. But you know what the consequences will be if you reject it. It is inevitable. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So Jesus Christ is the propitiation, which means the atoning sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath. Is the propitiation for our sins. This sacrifice is effective through faith in his blood, meaning that our faith in Christ's death, burial and resurrection, him living a perfect life, him fulfilling the law, is what brings us forgiveness. God's righteousness is demonstrated in this. He forgives sins and remains just because Jesus took the penalty for sin upon himself. Rather than giving it to us and making us pay the penalty, Christ has offered us a way so that we don't have to pay any penalty, so that we can have salvation. And he gave it to us for free. Verse 26, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Through Christ, God is both the just and the justifier. He remains just because sin is punished through Jesus and he justifies, which means to declare righteous, those who believe in Jesus. This is the heart of the, of the gospel. God upholds his justice while offering grace to those who have faith in Christ's finished work. I just want to reiterate here, it's not just about believing in Jesus or believing that Jesus existed. It is about believing in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. That is what the gospel is centered around. This is a powerful presentation of the gospel. Paul demonstrates that while the law reveals our sin and our inability to attain righteousness, God has provided a way out through Jesus Christ. Salvation is by faith, not by works, and it is freely given to all who believe. Jesus' sacrifice has satisfied and paid for the penalty that God's justice requires, making it, making it possible for us to be declared righteous. Verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So Paul asks, where's boasting? And then answers that boasting is completely excluded because salvation is not based on works, but on faith. Since justification is through faith in Christ's finished work and not by human effort, no one can boast about their righteousness. All those religious people that might stand there in their robes and thinking that they're higher level and, and they have deeper knowledge or more understanding or that they're closer to God. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay, The justification is through faith in Christ's finished work, not by human effort, not by anything that we do. No one can boast about their righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness or nothing. 328. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Paul concludes that justification is by faith alone, apart from works of the law. This verse encapsulates Paul's message of grace, that our standing before God is based on faith in Christ, not on adherence to the law. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. So Paul's confirming here that God is not only the God of the Jews in the Old Testament, 
but he's also the God of the Gentiles as well. He's made salvation available to all people through faith, which breaks down the division that used to be there between the Jews and the Gentiles. Verse 30, seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Now, there's a very important nuance in the distinction here between by faith and through faith in this verse. The faith of Christ. Paul's references to the faith of Christ, like what we went through in Romans 3.22, just a little bit earlier, highlights that it's Christ's perfect faith and obedience to God that ultimately justifies us. I'll just go back to 22 here. We'll just have a quick read of 22 again. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto on all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And back to verse 30. Our own faith in Christ connect... Oh, sorry. So Paul's reference. Paul's references... Let's just read this again. Paul's references to the faith of Christ, like in Romans 3.22 highlights that it's Christ's perfect faith and obedience to God that ultimately is what justifies us. Our own faith in Christ connects us to his perfect work, but it's his faith and his righteousness that truly provide our justification. We don't depend on our own imperfect faith to save us, but on Christ's perfect unwavering faithfulness this is a key distinction because our faith is fallible. But Christ's faith was and is flawless. It's infallible. You will have moments where you doubt, where you are, oh, you, you're unsure. Someone will rattle you. Someone will say something. You'll be discouraged. Things happen like that. Well, that is a lapse of faith, okay, which is not good. Thankfully, it's not up to us to have perfect faith. We need to put our trust in Christ's finished work and hold on to that in order to be saved. That will always be the case. The other thing that's really important here in verse 30 is you'll notice it says, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So by the justify the circumcision, which would have been Israel by faith and uncircumcision, which is Gentiles through faith. So by faith versus through faith in verse 30. By faith for the circumcision, which is Israel, Old Testament Israel, implies that they were expected to prove their faith by their works. While those works certainly did not justify them, they were necessary and they were an expression of their faith in that dispensation. This aligns with the understanding that Israel was under the law where faith was demonstrated through obedience and rituals that were part of the Mosaic Covenant. If you were an Israelite in the Old Testament and you had faith, you wouldn't sit there and say, well, look, you know what? I've got faith. I'm saved by grace through faith. I don't need to get circumcised. I don't need to worry about temple sacrifices. I'm good. I'm saved by grace. That's not how it worked. They weren't justified by their works, but their works were necessary. Their works were a requirement. Through faith, however, for the Gentiles, which is the uncircumcision, points to the faith of Christ being the only means through which we are justified. Gentiles don't need to prove their faith by the works of the law, but rather they trust in the perfect faith and finished work of Christ. It makes it very simple for us. This reflects the broader, more inclusive nature of salvation for all through the grace found in Christ alone. The fact that Christ's faith justifies us underscores the beauty of the gospel. We are saved not by our own striving or by proving ourselves through anything that we do, but by resting in Christ's perfect faith and his completed work on the cross. For Israel, works were a necessary expression of faith. For the Gentiles, salvation is simply received through faith in Christ's faithfulness and his finished work on the cross. This deepens our understanding of justi justification as something rooted not in our efforts, but in Christ's faith. It's critical detail that sheds light on the difference in how the law and grace function in God's plan of salvation. Verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? 
God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So you'll hear a lot of people when we preach the grace gospel, they'll say those people just think the law has been abolished. No, absolutely, it has not been abolished. The law will exist forever. The law is perfect. But what do we know about the law? What have we learnt here in this chapter? The law is to bring us to the knowledge of sin. We cannot keep the law. So then do we make void the law through our faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Another answer to a possible objection. Does faith nullify the law? Many Christians hate the grace movement because their carnal mind, their unsaved minds think that we have thrown away the law. But that is not what we say, nor is that what Paul said. He strongly refutes that idea, stating that faith actually establishes the law itself. This means that faith fulfills the law's true purpose, which is to lead people to recognize their sin and need for salvation in Christ. This is true biblical repentance. The law is perfect, but all it does is condemn us and it shows us our sin if we're honest and humble. If we lie, we won't see anything. And faith in Christ's fulfillment of the law and his perfect faith makes us righteous. That there completes Romans 3. Amazing chapter. And of course, it continues to just get deeper and deeper and deeper. Paul builds on the themes of universal sin and the insufficiency of the law to save. He clearly demonstrates once again that both Jews and Gentiles are guilty before God. And that we all need salvation, which is provided through faith in Christ's finished work. This chapter highlights that righteousness is a gift of God's grace, received through faith, not by works of the law. And Christ's sacrifice satisfies God's justice, allowing him to justify all who believe. Paul finishes up by affirming that faith doesn't nullify the law, okay? it doesn't do away with the law, but rather it fulfills the purpose of the law. Stay tuned for Romans 4 in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.